We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to follow up a little bit on some comments uh, that I heard at the, the last of it. I'm, uh, I'm still a trustee of Caltech, have been for 28 years. I look at alumni issues there. More importantly, I'm past president of the Texas Texas Alumni, which is a very large organization. The absolute key to being able to stay in contact and to draw on the resources is the database. And if you don't have that database constantly up to date, a sort of regular thing of updating it as people move the rest of it, then it's never going to reach its potential. We were about three years into RSI, and we talked for the first time about, well, there, we now have three classes. Can we put together an alumni organization? There was zero database. And Mark, in my recollection, is the one who began trying to pull together some database at that point in time to contact alumni. So that, that may have been the history of the, the oldest one that's still floating around. What we have the privilege of today to summarize this is to go through the experience of RSI, but much more its influence on careers, uh, family life, all the rest through the years. So I've lined up the panel uh, from a 1990 to a 1994 to a 1998 to 1999 classes. Uh, all of you were at MIT. No, I was at George Washington. It was still there before we made the move. So the other three of you are in now what everybody else has experienced subsequently. <laughs> Those first three were out in Le uh, Xerox facility in Leesburg uh, without all of the academic trappings that the rest of you have enjoyed. So they were the hardy pioneers in that group. Um, where did you go up? I grew up in North Carolina. And where were you in school when you came to RSI? I was at a, I was at a public school called uh, Enlo. And so it was a public high school in Raleigh, North Carolina. Junior and senior years? Oh, you actually, skipped a year, as I, I skipped recall. A, I skipped a year. So you I collapsed a I year. I combined my junior and senior year. So I basically went between my sophomore and my junior senior year. What's your most important memory? I'm sorry. What was your research project at RSI? I was working on fluid flow dynamics, which I have to say I only barely remember. <laughs> uh, and uh, where did you go on for baccalaureate? I went to Harvard. And then advanced degrees? Stanford. Stanford. And then you stayed on the West Coast? I stayed on the West Coast. I had all of my friends be like, Diane, you're a California girl. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then I got to California, and I'm like, oh, I like California. I think I'll stay. <laughs> Um, as you look back at RSI, uh, two real questions. Did you change in your time at RSI? And what's your best recollection? What, what did you come away with that you most treasured from RSI? I definitely think that I changed a fair bit at RSI. I think just, you know, as everyone sort of said, being surrounded by so many other smart kids, you know, having fun, working hard, you know, simultaneously, it was just an eye-opening experience. I think it sort of encouraged me to aim higher, to work harder, and to just keep going. Um, in terms of what I remember, honestly, I remember, you know, stomping in fountains in <laughs> Washington, D.C., and sort of just all the, like, you know, madcap experiences that when you get a group of kids together at that age, that you actually sort of that bonding experience of going out and having fun in addition to all of the hard work, you know, and just like the late night conversations and, you know, just really exploring what life is like. Yeah, I, I think you captured in the, the bonding experience yeah, absolutely. that came out of it. Yeah. Uh, and your career? Uh, I've been at Google now for about 15 and a half years. Um, I'm what's called a Google Fellow. It's uh, effectively the, you know, basically the highest level of an individual contributor. Um, at uh, Google, although I do manage a team. And I basically built my career on understanding like data and analytics and experimentation um, there. And you've also created a family along the way? I do. I have uh, a husband and I have two daughters who are six and eight. So they're lovely. They're here in Cambridge. I think some of you met them at the reception since they were, I was single parenting at that moment and they came with me. 
managing work, family life experiences? I think balancing work and family life is always challenging. Um, you know, it's just this, you know, inevitable sort of, you have to do everything and there's none of, never time for everything. And so something has to drop and you get very, very, very good at juggling and figuring out which balls you can carefully sit down to on one side while you juggle the rest. And then you have to be like, which ones do I have to pick up and juggle now? And that's basically, you know, what it takes to sort of manage work and family life. And, you know, one of my friends uh, basically says, it's the no guilt parent. Like, it's just, you just have to have no guilt. <laughs> Does that exist? I don't know that it exists, but I think it's a good thing to aim for. Yes. It's like, you know, look, I'm doing the best that I can do, and I'm working hard at both my job as well as my family life, and I just have to have no guilt. I'm doing my best. I uh, went to high school at 11, went to college at 15, uh, went to the Navy at 20, uh, married when I was just turned 27. Uh, the Navy in those days and expected that spouses would not work. So I grew up in the world where when having children, there's a, all of that was managed by my wife. I didn't have to share any, I did learn over time. I guess the thing I learned most when I'd be away and come back, I didn't change the rules. Yeah. If she'd created rules while I was gone, those rules stayed. You all are all in such a totally different world where the expectation, if you have a family, is that both probably are working and you've got to find balance that older generation like this was a challenge we didn't have. Lauren, where'd you grow up? I grew up in a suburb of Los Angeles called Palos Verdes. Yes. I grew up in a suburb of Los Angeles called Palos Verdes. And where were you in school when you came to RSI? I was in a public high school called Palos Verdes High School. Um, the thing I want to, oh, let's go ahead a bit. What was your research project? So I did research in combinatorics. Uh, my project was about enumerating self-avoiding walks, which are um, walks in the plane taking unit steps northeast, southwest, but cannot intersect themselves. Um, it was a sort of uh, enumerative project um, which interestingly um, was, was with a mentor who was a graduate student of Richard Stanley, who seven years later became my PhD advisor. Yeah. Um, so it and, was quite And an you also had an accelerated shorter high school time, as I recall. I mean, it wasn't, so I, I went to RSI after sophomore year. Yeah. Um, so in that sense. Baccalaureate? Um, I, so after high school, I went to Harvard. And from there? I did a year in England, um, Cambridge, England. Um, followed by a PhD at MIT. And faculty? So, um, so I had uh, postdocs at Berkeley and Harvard, and then I became um, a professor at, at Berkeley. I was tenure track there and got tenure in 2013. And you fairly recently have moved so, to the Harvard Right, faculty. so in July I returned. I moved to, back to yeah. Harvard. And uh, your field? Uh, combinatorics. <laughs> which I almost feel embarrassed to admit this, but um, I'm in exactly the same field that I was working on at RSI. Um, your, both uh, your memories from RSI and did it change you? So when I got to RSI, I'd had exposure to, to math, including number theory at, from, from previous summer programs and competitions, but I'd never been exposed to research and the fact that it could be a very creative process so it definitely opened my eyes to the idea that research could be a, a really interesting, engaging, um, creative field, uh, you know, future career. Um, but also, as many people have mentioned, just the peer group was incredibly exciting to be, you know, to be surrounded by these people who were so yeah. curious and so engaged with science. Uh, the, uh, last night I met the first father and son from RSI. But you have what I believe is unique, three sisters that followed, so four of you that, who went that's to right, RSI. That's right, so I'm the oldest of four girls, and we all went to RSI. I believe there's one other family, the Doran family, who also sent four that siblings to four, RSI, yeah. but they have some boys in there. What careers have they <laughs> what my, careers Two of my have, sisters, by the way, are somewhere back here. Yeah. What careers have they followed? So all of us went into STEM, so Eleanor, who was next to me in age, um, she's, in, she's also a professor. She does oceanography. Um, 
So in terms of our majors, I did math, she did applied math, Elizabeth did physics, Jen did civil engineering. So we all sort of went gradually from, from pure to more applied, but we're all in, <laughs> <laughs> we're, all, um, we're all in STEM, the first two of us as academics, and Elizabeth and Jen are in business. Um, yeah, Jen's at Facebook. Ben, you are sort of unique in this group. Uh, the Admiral Rickover would not have been happy of where you went after RSI, but I think he'd be very happy at seeing what you've accomplished at this stage. Take us back, where were you, uh, where were you in school when you came to RSI? Uh, I grew up in Iowa, uh, in Des Moines, um, went to Roosevelt Public High School. And uh, where was it, were you juniors, between your junior and senior years when you came? Yep, okay. I was between Where'd you do your baccalaureate work? Uh, I went to Yale, um, and I ended up studying political science, and uh, <laughs> I remember I told my grandfather, who's a physicist, uh, if I was going to study political science, he said, that's not science. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, just, just for a note, even though I spent much of my life in the technology world, I'm history, government, economics as my uh, baccalaureate field. Um, back to the same question on RSI. Uh, what was your research project while you were at RSI? Uh, I was in a biology lab at BU Med Center, and we were studying uh, cell death, P53. And then, um, what's your best memory of RSI? Did it change you, and how? Yeah, I mean, I remember it being a really special experience. I was reflecting on it last night. Uh, I remember, actually, it was one of the first times I ever felt cool, uh, <laughs> uh, which, was, which was really, I mean, it, it sounds small, but it, it's like a big deal. All of a sudden, the people around you uh, are into the things that you're into. Um, and I also remember that school up until that point had basically been about making sure that you understood things that had already been figured out by other people. And it was one of the first times that everyone around me was trying to figure out new things. Um, and that was very exciting to know that um, uh, that's where kind of college and, and career would take, take folks after, after you got out of high school. Um, and you took a turn toward a business career. Yeah, I worked in, I worked in Washington, D.C. for a while, um, and then I moved out to California uh, and worked briefly at Google, um, and then uh, left to try to do startups. Um, and and uh, the first few didn't work out. Uh, the one um, that worked out is Pinterest, which is uh, the startup I work on now. Otherwise known as a unicorn? I, I, I think so, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, uh, the, uh, what's it been like building a company? Uh, it's been fun. Uh, you know, I think that uh, it's probably very different from research, but what's similar is you don't really know uh, what's going to work until you try it out. And then uh, I think you develop a good tolerance for uh, making mistakes. Yeah, there's a research side sure. as you develop what products you're going to have and offer. Yeah, I mean, I think it's... Uh, yeah, it's kind of a journey into the unknown, and it's, it's fun. And I think that the most fun thing about building a company um, is that you get to create an organization where you get to bring on other people that know a lot of things that you don't know, uh, and then you get to work on it together. And I think that a lot of my favorite projects, looking back all the way into school, were projects where um, a group of us all knew different things, uh, and then we all got to work together to make something that none of us could have made individually. Yeah. And how many employees at this point? There are about 1,500 employees. Yeah. Uh, have you ever been able to stop raising money? Uh, <laughs> hopefully soon. Uh. <laughs> the, the world of a startup company, sure, always. Sure. Uh, Juan? Yep. Uh, the same series of questions. Where were you in school <laughs> before you? Came to RSI. Uh, I was born in China, and I uh, immigrated to Des Moines, Iowa um, when I was 11, and uh, went to uh, public school, Roosevelt High School, and uh, that's where I met Ben, and I thought you were pretty cool. <laughs> 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 um, and uh, went to RSI when that, uh, between my junior and senior year. Uh, ben Did Ben had, influence you to go to yeah, RSI? Yeah, so Ben had gone to RSI the year before, and then yeah. when he came back, he's, he talked to me and he said, Feng, I just went to this really cool program. Um, you should uh, apply to that program too, so that you can be cool also. <laughs> um, where'd you pursue your baccalaureate? 
Um, I went to Harvard, um, studied chemistry and physics, and then went to Stanford and did my PhD in chemistry, uh, and then went back to uh, Harvard at a Society of Fellows uh, briefly, and then, uh, and then started my lab here at the Brody Institute. Now, have you also started the company? Um, yeah, I started um, one company um, about six years ago called Editas Medicine. So my lab works on developing a way to change DNA in cells. And, um, and that company uh, is working on trying to turn that into a real drug so that we can treat genetic diseases and uh, improve uh, blindness or treat cancer. I moved from the Navy to the private sector in uh, 80, to actually got started in 83. Mm -hmm. And while doing a lot of other things, between 84 and 2016, I invested in 57 early stage companies. And I'd always been told that one out of three would be successful. Mm. We did a little better than that, but not a lot uh, in the process. It's a lot of hard work mm. along the way. Uh, your favorite memories out of RSI, how it changed your experience? Um, I remember, um, so, so I, I think uh, of all the things, uh, RSI uh, really gave me a lot of very important friendships. Uh, I think uh, most of my closest friends now, uh, even to date, uh, are all friends that I made at RSI. Um, one memory uh, from RSI is that uh, Sish and I and Alex Clark and I were trying to make a t-shirt uh, for the RSI summer program, and we uh, wandered our way into the media lab because they had some pretty nice computers. Yes. But we wanted to work together next to each other, so we unplugged a few computers and <laughs> brought them together. But um, unexpectedly, we unplugged one of the servers that someone was running something important on. And so, uh, so the following morning, we found out that we were banned from the media lab and we uh, <laughs> were never to set foot again. Um, I've snuck back in at media lab again uh, since I came back to MIT as a professor, but I never told people that I was the same person who unplugged those computers. <laughs> Through the years and tracking, I've always uh, envied those of you who had the experience of RSI, uh, when you're three years younger than your peers in high school, you're simply a freak. You're not cool mm -hmm. in the process. Saving factor for me was I went to college in 46 with the veterans coming back from World War II. Mm -hmm. They were six to eight years older. Mm -hmm. They had uh, fought a war. Uh, they were eager to get an education. They also played hard, and they took me on as their mascot. Mm. Uh, so that's my counterpart <laughs> for the friendships that help shape you yeah. and change how things go. How fortunate we all have been to, at an early stage in our lives, have a group of people mm -hmm. who serve both as mentors and friends uh, through the years. Um, where should RSI go from here? You know, I think the most important thing is that I really want RSI to continue, right? And so from that perspective, figuring out a way to ensure the sustainability of the existing program, I, in my opinion, has to be the top priority. I think the second priority after that has to sort of be thinking about scale. But I would want to ensure the sustainability of the existing program first. So I agree with everything that Diane said. Um, I think also, and this was touched on yesterday in a panel, um, making sure that kids at high schools around the nation and in other countries are aware of it. I mean, there's lots of bright students out there who just yeah. don't know that it exists. So that's another thing to think about. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I came to this session was to make a pitch to those of you who benefited from RSI to look substantially further out into the future. Uh, the glue that has held RSI together, and it was Joanne. And there is the reality that she's not going to be here in perpetuity. And that's why it becomes so important for those of you who have benefited from it to start thinking out ahead. What, how do you sustain? Clearly, the emphasis Mark and others were putting on the financial stability is part, but also nailing down so that as successors eventually have to be sought out and found, that the real strengths of this program 
and what it's done mm -hmm. for you all and for hopefully for all the other. We can not only capture, but pursue it, make sure that this is something that lives for a lot longer. Questions anybody would ask, like to ask this panel? We may end up being a shorter run than in plan. Um, come back for um, thoughts you all have. Ben? On, on the future of RSI? Yeah. On, on anything you'd like to talk to at this point. <laughs> on anything? Oh my God. Wide open field. We got, we got half an hour that we can ramble. Oh, geez. Uh, sorry, give me a minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm, you know, Fung and I were actually talking yesterday at his house that looking back, you're very thankful for the people that make, uh, uh, you know, an impact on your life. And um, I you know I'd really like to, I'd really like to see for our side two things. You know, one one we talked about today, which is, you know, communities are really about uh, the the amount of participation between the members and the strength of those relationships. But people are busy and they're doing different things, and so, you know, finding ways, even small ways, to yeah. keep those communities going. And I think the other is, to me, the the continuity of RSI really depends on recruiting um, uh, one one leader uh, who will be able to carry it forward. Um, Boards are great, and uh, funding can be found, but but having somebody that puts kind of their personal time uh, into leading it, and so I think a really good challenge for joining the board is to find that person that will want to make it a goal for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, uh, because the clarity of vision becomes very important, especially when you have so many smart, uh, opinionated people um, that have benefited from it, and you need someone to say, we're going to do this and we're not going to do that, and that comes with trade-offs, uh, but that's okay. Um, so I think that's a good challenge for us to think about who might want to um, make it their legacy to continue yeah. the program. Um, I think the name of the organization, the Center for Excellence in Education, um, Excellence in Education, is, is a very good name. And uh, if you look at the people who have come through the program, um, have graduated from the program and gone on to do more things, they have really um, excelled in, in achieving excellence. And they have exhib uh, exhibited ex excellence and demonstrated excellence and, and in many ways uh, transfer that desire to have excellence to many other people. RSI brings in 50 students every summer uh, from the US and 30 from around the world. And those are 80 people who are uh, being influenced and, and uh, sort of cultured um, in, in this environment. It would be great if RSI could amplify that. Um, if beyond the 80 people each year, we can do 160 or 320 or 640. Um, if we can spread this desire to achieve excellence, which has become less and less of an emphasis, is more becoming in society nowadays, uh, my students in grad school are more focused on material wealth or more focused on um, joy and having fun. But less and less is, less, uh, fewer and fewer people really emphasize the need for excellence. And that's what I think the world is starting to miss. And if somehow the center can really spread this message of achieving excellence and, and celebrating um, excellence um, and, and crafting a vision around that and really carry that on for the next 30, 300, 3,000 years, um, that would be incredible and we'll be able to do the world um, such a great service. We have long longed for the prospect of replicating RSI in other locations. And we did one at the University of California, San Diego. Anybody here who was in that? Yeah. Uh, couple of hands in that process, but we were not able to sustain it. Um, I think we all became persuaded uh, once it came to MIT that Optimum was being at a research university in the process and the ability then to reach out to the community. I have not totally given up on the idea we'd try to do one maybe smaller at Caltech somewhere down the way. But I think um, the degree that you have any ties, uh, we probably want to move it geographically mm -hmm. around. But if we could reach a stage where we had a couple of RSIs or three RSIs uh, to run, then just the number, the talent that you could attract and, mm -hmm. and draw. So keep that in your mind of 
things to work on. I'm going to break off and tell a story. How did I end up uh, in this process with it? Um, I had been very fortunate to be promoted very early and became the director of naval intelligence in sep 16 September 1974. Um, Admiral Rickover was the menace for all directors of naval intelligence because he wanted to know every detail of what the submarines had collected on their reconnaissance missions around the Soviet Union or trailing submarines or the rest of it. And he refused to sign any security oath. So it was a constant ongoing battle. He wanted total access and wouldn't sign any security oath. You got a little bit of that in the, the uh, 60 minute interview last night. So I'd been the director of naval intelligence for six weeks. And Secretary Kimberly and Admiral Rickover is calling. So I pick up the phone and say, Inman, this very mild, gentle voice came on the phone saying, Admiral, I was, you may know I'm writing a book about the sinking of the USS Maine in Havana Harbor. I didn't. And uh, I was at the Spanish Embassy last night. And the Spanish naval attaché told me he thought there might be files on that sinking in the Spanish Naval Museum in Madrid. Could you find out? And hung up. <laughs> the only thing I'd ever said was Inman in the process. Here is where luck in careers and life can have such a big impact. Naval Intelligence School classmate of mine, Larry Gallagher, was the US Naval Attaché in Madrid. He was a history buff. He spent a lot of time at the Spanish, and entertained at the Spanish Naval Museum. He went, there was a file, because they knew him and trusted him, they let a curator take those files with him to the US Embassy to Xerox them, replicate them. And then Larry found somebody flying back to Washington that night. And the next morning, still in Spanish, we had the files on Admiral Rickover's desk. And from that day to the day he died, I could do no wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so unlike the stories so many other people had, which is almost not. Um, about every six months, he'd call me up and say, in man, I hear you're doing a good job, and hang up. <laughs> that was the extent of it. Until he asked me to serve on the, the uh, Rickover Foundation board. So opportunities opened that I'd never expected in that process. OK, questions from out there? Anybody would like to ask us? Yes, please. Hi. I wanted to pick up on this theme of scale that's come up good. a couple times so far. So uh, I live in California with several of you. And uh, I think one thing that the Silicon Valley community gets right, or at least does very well, is this rapid scaling to large audiences. But they don't do it by replicating exactly the small scale form, right? I went to Harvard. I got a physical Facebook, this printed book. Facebook is not just this gigantic yeah. printed book for the whole world. You know, Google's not a gigantic library and so forth. <coughs> and I wonder, I'd be curious to hear from the panel whether any of you have thoughts of something that's related to RSI? I mean, but maybe not the same, something that, that could scale uh, more than the literal printing out other communities at other institutions that I gather has been difficult to scale in the past? What, what we've done uh, in not finding another university willing to collaborate with us was to then to expand to the Olympic uh, island and to go to other fields that expand the influence and bring in bright talent. But it doesn't begin to be the scale uh, that I think we need over the long term. Um, along with my business career uh, these last 35 years, I was pro bono team teaching a graduate class at UT Austin. And then to my utter amazement, in 2001, they offered me tenure, full professor, flagship chair in the LBJ school. And what I discovered, um, once you have tenure, uh, you got a lot of independence. But you can also push issues. So part of my making this pitch for those who are on faculties, particularly if they're not here in the Northeast. Think about, could you generate interest 
at the universities where you are on the faculty for the value, both in recruiting very bright talent to come, plus the broader contribution to the society of scaling. Because I keep trying to find links. We've got a brilliant uh, young RSI graduate uh, at UT Austin, uh, chemistry. Um, that's not quite yet of scale enough between the two of us to move that institution. And I, I just, if we could break through, we've not been successful at either Berkeley or Stanford in our efforts trying before. Um, I mentioned the early UC San Diego that we couldn't replicate. Caltech remains the prime focus right now, albeit maybe a smaller program instead of uh, 50, 35, and adding some in along the way. I guess just to be clear, though, I'm, I'm asking, if you wanted to get to 100,000 students or yes. a million, you'd have to do something different. Yeah. And I'm curious, I mean, I'd be curious if anyone has any thoughts we, what that we've different got thing to, might we've be. We've got to find a geographic spread. I, I'd ask you all, um, what's your view of the impact of being at a large public university as opposed to uh, UC San Diego was still fairly small when we were there. Uh, it was still growing. Uh, but MIT has been the base for the most of it. Thoughts, ideas? Probably not going to be an iPhone app that amplifies in that way. But I think if you think about what um, has come, or, or if you think about one of the things that we gained um, by going to RSI is the peer-to-peer um, influence and also mentorship, and, and also mentorship from, from other people. And if you extract, if you extract from that a little bit more, going through our development uh, as a as a kid growing up, and also our career development, um, what has been probably most influential are the mentorships that we receive. And so, one way to amplify that might be through every single record that has come through the program. Um, each one of them serving as a mentor for many, many more um, students of the next generation. I'm an educator, and, and whether you're in education or you're in the workforce, you are serving as a mentor for, for people who, um, who work with you. And if that idea of excellence and mentorship and coaching uh, is something that's, that's more sort of spread out um, and, and embraced by everybody that comes through the program, you see that principal compounding take place. Mm -hmm. and, um, and if the people that you mentor also then carry on that value, um, I think within you know, several gen a couple of generations of, our, of Rikwais, uh, we'll be able to have a broad impact because Rikwais are distributed throughout the world, um, throughout in different industries. And, and that effect, I think, will, will really take, play, uh, sort of take on its li uh, a life of its own. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> One of our challenges in trying to raise funds in the early stages was the view that this was somehow an elitist activity and that uh, there were all kinds of programs to support disadvantaged, uh, underserved. And we couldn't generate uh, any significant enthusiasm why you wanted to stretch and push the top talent to go sort of explore the frontiers. I think, frankly, that's still, to some degree, is a problem. Uh, I'm elated at how brilliant you all have proven to be. Uh, and that's true, for, I think, for the overwhelming majority of the people who've gone through RSI. But what we don't, it is not an elitist organization in the social sense. It is hopefully elitist in pushing uh, intellectual stimulation and challenge along the way. Thank you. Another question? Uh, sorry, I, I'm just going to add one thing to Please. Zach's question, which is that um, if I sort of think about scale, one big question is what trade-offs you're willing to make, yeah. right? And so there is, you know, to the point of a lot of the tech companies in, you know, in Silicon Valley, you know, as they sort of have scaled, let's say, connection with Facebook or, you know, information gathering with Google, there are fundamental trade-offs that are made in the nature of what's being done. So I think the real question has to be is that as we sort of think about scaling, what trade-offs would we be willing to make versus not, right? And I do think that 
some of the key aspects, which you know, I think you know, talking to everyone here has basically been, has been both that peer connection and to Fang's point, that mentorship. And so I don't, and so there is a question about which aspects are really central mm -hmm. and therefore, quite frankly, may fundamentally limit scale, right? And then, you know, there may be other ways of sort of thinking about that scale and thinking about that paying it forward right. that may be a more scalable process, but that is likely going to be an adjunct as opposed to a primary. And so I think that has to be kind of like the overall debate that has to happen. That's a great point. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, so something that uh, Dr. Zhang said uh, at the beginning of the event on, on Friday, and uh, I hope I, I don't mis misstate what you said, but it really resonated with me was, I believe you said something to the effect of why don't we this weekend uh, try to do something together uh, to make some sort of positive impact? And so uh, this is a very open-ended question. I, I hate to put you on the spot like this, but I'm curious to hear uh, the panelists' opinions on what they think is the biggest challenge that faces humanity today as a whole. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, we'll I, I don't, I don't mean to like put you on the spot. <laughs> Um, do, you, do you want to tackle it first? What's your view of the biggest challenge facing humanity today? Um, so I, 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 um, there's, there are so many challenges in the world now, um, but I think one of the things, since we're, we're talking about education and talking about um, uh, mentoring and so forth, I do think that one of the, one of the things that's, that's a major challenge is training and and getting good teachers, uh, good mentors. Um, yesterday, when Ben and I were chatting, one of the things that we we uh, both sort of uh, thought was really important is that we had we we were really benefiting from teachers who were by themselves passionate and um, and really genuinely committed to seeing the development and growth of, of their students. Um, Ben mentioned our, our, uh, our speech and debate coach who would uh, drive on the weekend these teenagers uh, to different debate tournaments to the middle of nowhere uh, in Nebraska or South Dakota and, and live in these um, really not very comfortable motels, um, all really to help these students excel and develop uh, their ability to communicate, to express themselves. Um, and my high school biology teacher who would go to Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories every summer and take courses there. And she would uh, come back to her class and teach us about the things, the new things that she learned from those summer classes. These were teachers who just genuinely uh, passionate about the subject they were teaching. And, and the students can feel that. And, and that passion is infectious. We need more teachers like that. Um, um, we need more mentors who can convey their passion and, and infect other people around them with that passion. And if we can do more of that, um, the world um, will get slightly better. Uh, we'll, we'll still have other problems to solve too, but, but I think uh, that's the place to start. Ben? Um, I mean, I always think about kind of two problems that are almost kind of like conditions of the species. <laughs> uh, one is, um, they, there's this term of collective action problem, uh, which is we all see a big problem, but people have a hard time uh, getting behind it and pushing in the same direction uh, because other salient aspects of who they think of themselves as starts to get in the way. Yeah. And those aspects are many. It could be nationality, it could be economic status. Um, but uh, this is a really big one because the new challenges that people face uh, are now global in scale, things like climate change. Um, and so I, I think about that one a lot, and especially think about it now, because when I was studying undergraduate political science, a lot of the things that we talked about, almost as like dorm room chatter freshman year, those are now the conversations that the largest technology companies are having today. And so um, they felt very abstract then, and suddenly they've become very concrete now. Uh, and I think more people need to focus on um, what are the common aspects uh, of people's uh, shared fate and identity. So that's one problem. And then the other problem is like a micro version of this problem. And uh, people are really 
pretty good at knowing what's good for them in the long term, but pretty bad at figuring out how to act upon that in the short term. Um, and this comes up a lot, like uh, you eat too much sugar or you drink too much alcohol or you don't exercise. Uh, and it sounds like such a simple problem, but it's very hard to change those behaviors. So I'm very optimistic about um, technology's role in actually playing a very positive, uh, kind of helping to make your short-term decisions align with what you want long-term. Um, and so those are the two kinds of problems that I think about a lot. Thank you. Lauren? Uh, within education, um, and I, I, I'm worried about this, this sort of anti-elitist um, attitude, which seems to be kind of permeating um, yep. at least the cities I've lived in. Uh, I grew up, you know, I went to, to public schools growing up and at a time when they had a gifted and talented program. But as budgets got cut, it was the first to go. Yep. Everybody wants to pull people up at the bottom and they don't worry about, um, about the people, um, about the rest. Um, so within education, that would be the biggest problem I'm worried about. Um, personally, climate change is, is the thing I'm most concerned about right now. And I think we have to worry about making our world population more scientifically literate so that they understand that there's a problem and we can figure out what to do about it. Okay. Diane? I'm going to riff a little bit on both what Ben and Lauren have said, you know, because if I sort of look at the world around, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned about climate change and all of us with that, but I'm actually going to key off of one thing that I think Feng said earlier, which is excellence, right? And, you know, to your point about, you know, that anti, at least it's, it's almost like an anti-excellence um, attitude, right? And if you sort of look at how the world has shifted in the past even five years, right, the world has changed a lot. You know, I, I come at this a little bit from a Google perspective where I think a lot about information, right? And information has shifted from how do I even find the information to now, today, in today's world, information is being weaponized, right? And we're in a much more adversarial, uh, you know, world where you know, people are sort of throwing around different information. And in part, I do agree with Lauren that it's that scientific literacy because there's this question about what is fact, you know, true observables, raw data. You know, where you get to science is this question about inference, right? Yes, I can have debates about climate change, but I fundamentally have a repeatability and a robustness to my inference. And we can debate about the modeling and the predictions and things along those lines. But then you sort of start conflating inference with interpretation and opinion. And I don't think that there's a clear understanding about what is sort of based in fact and science, even if it's up for debate, relative to sheer opinion. And that's sort of leading to this increased adversarial world. And if you sort of think about it, it's actually an underlying values debate, right? And the value debate, you know, especially in the United States, is this question about how we sort of think about this egalitarian free speech, everyone should have a voice, relative to this point about intellectual integrity and scientific basis. And, and you're almost having to sort of figure out how to walk a fine balance <laughs> between some of these values. And so, you know, I, you know, I do think that climate change, you know, and trying to get everyone to sort of act collectively is a key part of it. But I think the foundation has to really be in that appreciation and understanding of what excellence means and how to sort of start navigating this much more adversarial world. Uh, my challenge. My, mine is a reminder I've spent the bulk of my adult life involved with the outside world. Uh, for me, it's poverty, global poverty. Uh, we have it in our own country still. Uh, it's not just food and shelter, uh, health, education. Uh, and I do believe that it's going to have to be broken down into individual problems. It's too large globally to go after. And science is going to lead the way uh, in helping us solve those problems. You look, China now has a billion three people. 700 million of those are prospering. But there's still a very large segment in poverty. India may be soon the largest country by population. Huge amount still in poverty. So much of Africa and the rest of it. So. I think as you look at how do you change humanity and move it forward, it is in making progress in reducing the pockets of poverty globally. Uh, last question. Thank you. So, um, oh, is there something from? Oh, there would be a second, then. I didn't realize you were waiting. Go ahead. Thank you. 
Um, so I know that, like a lot of the discussion has been geared toward RSI students. Um, I participated in the USABO uh, program. So uh, one thing I definitely had to call out is that um, I was very lucky to have a teacher who would, I mean, proctor the exam for me and allow me to participate in this competition. Um, and I guess one thing after I, um, later I went on, when I visited the USABO website, I found out there was a new section that says, you know, if you need help finding a place to take the exam, we will let you do that. And I think that really spoke to me because, um, I mean, I had trouble finding a place to take the exam the first time uh, that I took it. So um, I, I really appreciate that being done by the CE, definitely. But um, maybe speaking to your experiences, records, um, what sort of role would you see for yourself as an advocate of these programs or being available as mentors to students who would um, perhaps be interested in, um, in programs like the USABO or uh, maybe in help applying to RSI or be, at least being made available of su such opportunities. Thank you. Diane, do you want to start with, please? I, uh, yeah. uh, no. <laughs> I don't want to start. Lauren. So. Uh, Lauren's ready. <laughs> so, so for me, it's easy. I've just moved back to, to Harvard. Um, I moved just in July, so too late to be a mentor. But starting next summer, um, myself or my students can be mentors for RSI students. Yeah. Ben, Bum? Yeah, I think I, I might have like uh, lost the educational uh, qualification to be an excellent mentor. <laughs> um, but I, I, I'm really interested in, in, in how to help the community uh, of RSI alums kind of work together more efficiently. And since I'm in California and there are a lot of RSI folks there, it's kind of a natural place to start. Um, I, I've mentored RSI students in my lab and, um, and look forward to um, mentoring more students uh, in the coming summers. Um, I think this concept of paying it forward uh, in, in different ways that you have benefited from, uh, I think is, is, is good. And, 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 um, and I think hopefully some of those students will then also pay it forward and, um, and spread that. And, um, and overall, I think um, when, whenever you're working with young students and you see their their energy and excitement, and, and <coughs> it just, in some ways, rejuvenates you uh, in, in how you are thinking about science. But at the same time, when you see that, you want to nurture that. You want to keep that flame going and, and help them um, achieve what they want to achieve. Uh, last question. Hi, my name is Max. Um, I turned 11 on Friday, and I'm excited to go to RSI in about Five and a half years. <laughs> what advice would you give for me? Anybody want to tackle that? Oh, it's wonderful to see you early on. I would say work hard and keep trying and experimenting, experimenting with different things. I th there's, you know, so much just comes from you know, just continuing to just like, you know, you're at the age now where experimentation is really, you know, a large part of it, you know, try out, you know, to dig into science and, you know, biology and physics, but also engineering and quite frankly, the writing and, you know, everything. So I, I would really, especially at your age, focus a lot on just trying the breadth of what's sort of out there. Yeah. It's a little early to sort of specialize, but I'd say work hard, <laughs> work hard and try everything. Best advice. Um, we're going to bring this to a close. And I thank very much the panel for coming and sharing their views. And, and I love the fact that we've already got a candidate for RSI five years out. Um, first career was Navy. Changed at 51. Second career was running two businesses, getting involved in venture capital pro bono teaching, decade running companies, then a decade of primarily doing venture capital teaching, and then the shift to teaching as the process. Now, why recite that for you? Every time I changed, there was a shot of adrenaline because I no longer knew great certainty about everything I was going to do. How is that relevant here? Particularly those of you in the classes in the 80s and now in the 90s. You're progressing well in your careers. You're going to reach a point out there 
when you're 50, 55, when you may want to do something different. Think about being the next leader of the Center of Excellence in Education is what you might have in mind. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.